Hey fellow tennis nerds and welcome to another tennis nerd vlog. I'm here in a living room and I'm wearing this Volet new kit called Aloha. It looks pretty cool to me. I'm gonna wear it on court tomorrow. Uh, but for now I'm just gonna wear it doing this vlog. Let's now see what you have been asking. Alex Mann, what was your first ever racket you remember playing with? Good question. Uh, I think I started with something like a Wilson Sting when I was six years old. It was everything that it should have been. Uh, quite a difficult racket to start with, but that's how it came to be. The first series racket I ever used was a Wilson N Code 6195. Excellent racket that I still can pick up and use today. Uh, it's a really nice one. One question from M Hamdi94. Uh, did you try as hard as you could to become a professional tennis player? No, I did not. I had a really long break from tennis. I um, played tennis when I was a kid and a junior, but then I quit for quite a few years and then I came back to the sport when I was around 22 years old after a stint in uh, US when I went to university and started to become a journalist. Uh, and then I fell in love with tennis again and about 10 years later I started writing for Tennis Nerd. One question from Giorgio Official. Do any ATP pros use the Wilson Clash that you know of? One of my good friends, Henrik from Sweden, who is also a tennis racket reviewer, he has confirmed that a few guys are actually using the Clash on the pro level. Fernando Romboli, who's actually using it, uh, I think he's ranked around 100 in the world, so good player. Another guy called Roberto Sid Suberbi. Uh, so those are two guys. On the women's side, uh, there's one player who I don't remember the name of as of now. There are a few players using the Clash. Uh, it will take time before a new model actually hits home with pros and I think you might see the younger generation of pros coming up that they will use that a lot more but for now you won't see that many players making a, such a significant switch. Uh, for pros, it's I mean tennis is their livelihood, they need to really count on the centimeters, uh, what kind of racket and specs they have to play with. So it's not as easy as for a rec player or a club player to switch frame and switch string and switch weight and balance. So you will rarely see these kind of major switches. There are a few uh, racket nerds out there in on the top levels of the ATP. You have um, Grigor Dimitrov, which has been going back and forth between different pro staffs for quite a while. He started with the head prestige, but he's been going back and forth between the different pro staff 93, 97, uh, a little bit all over the place uh, as his game is at the moment as well. So uh, he's one of those notorious racket switchers. Another guy is Fernando Verdasco, uh, who's been using different pro stocks from head. Before he used to play with Technifiber, uh, he's played Dunlop, he's been with a few different brands and a lot of rackets. Recently he was uh, heard testing the head radical oversize limited, the head radical oversize limited, so he's still <laughs> playing around with frames and he's on the top level of the game. So I think um, there are definitely racket switchers also on the higher echelons of tennis. And a lot of pros, they actually keep tweaking their frames. For example, Nadal has been adding more lead to his frame and his setup uh, over the years. He's still playing with his old APD original, the first edition of the Dubablat Aero Pro Drive. I actually have one here. Took it out on court yesterday. It's not strong with what Rafa strings it with but this is pretty much what he uses, but he, um, they, dif they paint it differently. The mes measured stiffness seems to be a little bit different, so I'm not sure it's a unique layup. Uh, I can't really answer that, but it's basically this mold uh, of a frame. This is uh, one of the best uh, Aero Pro drives, pure arrows, in my opinion, because it has the most uh, reliable string bed. I took it out yesterday and I really enjoyed playing with it, and I keep one around in case I feel like it. But he's been adding lead and now he's up to around 300. 40 almost, uh, but he started in stock 4. How do you end up in Malta? Good question. I've been here since 2007. Um, I took a job kind of on a whim uh, with an online gaming company. There are quite a few online gaming companies here. They do betting and casino and stuff like that. Uh, I took up a job and um, I kind of fell in love with this island and its lifestyle. So, uh, And then I fell in love with a woman here as well. So it's it's kind of that's where the path goes. I travel quite a bit and uh, I try to go in between Marbella, Spain and Malta, which are two of my favorite locations. Originally I'm from Sweden, so that's where I um, also go back from time to time. Uh, so those three locations are kind of 
where you might see me shooting some tennis nerd stuff, but mainly Malta and Marbella. How did your business come to be? Um, the business, if you mean tennis nerd, has not been in any way or form any main income for me. I hope one day I could uh, make a living doing only tennis nerd. That's my would be an aspiration for me. Uh, I'm otherwise I'm an online marketing consultant. I've been working in marketing director positions for quite a few years in different online companies. So that's where my my career is. So I've started Tennis Nerd in 2012. I just started writing a bit. So I love tennis, I always loved tennis, ever since I was a little boy running around in the streets doing air swings. Uh, so I've always been kind of obsessed with tennis, but I never really had a natural outlet for it. And I, I've always followed uh, the tour uh, and I've always been very interested in technique and all brackets, obviously. So um, it became a natural progression. So I've been working on it for a while, but now the last two years I've kind of accelerated because I really like it a lot. I like writing a lot. So I've, I've written two books before, but those are novels and not tennis related. But Tennis Nerd kind of keeps me going with my writing and uh, also communicating with Tennis Nerd fans and, and you guys, which I love. So um, it's a great hobby. I hope one day it can become a job and uh, that's where my kind of aspirations go. Shoulder wrist pain due to racket weight from Joao then Sneto. A heavy racket can be a blessing and a curse. It depends, the weight of a racket. When it comes to the shoulder, if you're serving and smashing and, and using it, uh, the weight can actually be a bit tricky and can lead to injuries and when it comes to the wrist yes as well it depends on how much wrist you're using and if you're using an incorrect technique then the weight can be a problem but that the same goes also if you have less weight because the racket can be unstable and when the ball hits makes contact with the racket it's gonna twist in your hand and then you're gonna get wrist pain as well and you're gonna get vibrations sent to your arm so it really depends on your technique I, usually the technique is the issue and not the weight of the racket uh, if I would recommend anything is to work on your game and, and not think too much about gear. Gear is important, obviously, that's why I uh, started Tennis Nerd and I really care about gear, but really technique is where it all is and if you want to become a better player and avoid injury. Also, fitness, uh, I really recommend signing up to a gym and do, or doing your yoga or other exercises and I will try to do more content around that because I really think that's an important way, important path to becoming a better tennis player. So shoulder wrist pain due to weight, if it's really, really heavy, yes, it can be an issue. Otherwise, no, I mean, I don't, don't think a, a 340 gram racket will give you more arm pain or issues than a 310. So depends a lot on your technique, what strings you use, how stiff your racket is and other things. One question from Shooter000111 only two ones actually. Have you tried the new Technifiber Ice Code 10 string? Your thoughts about it? I have not tried this string. I saw it got, got a really nice review from Tennis Warehouse. Uh, I do like te Technifiber strings. Um, I actually have a review soon on the website that you can check out from a tennis friend of mine. He has been testing this, he's a good player and uh, he will give his thoughts on this string very soon. So check out tennisnerd.net for that review. One question from Tito Chop, is Federer using the Pro Staff RF97 made with different material or just different weight? That's the eternal question for a lot of tennis nerds, do the pros you get fantastic magical frames? No, a Pro Stock is not a magical frame, there's nothing magical about Federer's frame. I haven't held it myself but I've you know, seen reports and I know tennis people who have and it's a tennis racket and uh, his talent comes from, from from his game and his footwork and technique, it's not the racket. The racket helps him to perfect his game perhaps, but it's not due to any magic materials. If you pick up a Pro Staff RF97, you will notice that it's quite heavy to swing, quite difficult to use, but those days when you're on your game, it's gonna work beautifully and feel like a magic wand even for you. So I think uh, the racket is demanding, but in the hands of the right players, such as Federer with his amazing talent, I think, you will see magic happen from time to time, but there's nothing special in the ingredients. In general, I've been playing with a lot of different pro player frames in my uh, tennis life, and there's nothing magic about them, really. So don't, uh, don't get too obsessed with the magic of a pro stock, because you should, most pro stocks are just all the recreational frames that have their specific weight and balance. Aaron God, 03, what made you change your serve into a platform? I've been looking at myself playing a lot because I record a lot of the sessions. I don't record every session, but I, re I record when I do reviews and I uh, and when the camera is uh, charged enough. And uh, you know, I, I did see that partly I, I had 
risk of foot faulting a bit too much, I think. Uh, there is too much weird movement going on when I was doing the pinpoint stance and, or setting up for the pinpoint stance. It's not as clean as if you look like a guy like Alex Zverev or, or guys on the tour. It wasn't just that toe drag and then I just had a little bit of a quirky step there. Didn't really know how to fix it and then I looked at some um, other players and I tried to see okay, what are they doing with the platform stance and in the end decided to try to do a platform stance. The problem with my platform stance at the moment is that I'm not really getting enough movement into the court naturally. I do that more when I, I do my pinpoint, quirky pinpoint serve, but I don't really get that natural movement. So I'm trying to work on that now and that's my kind of next step. But I would like the platform stance to work because it seems more natural to me. But it's it's something I'm, I'm trying to figure out a bit. And I, I obviously need the serve to be uh, working well because otherwise it's very difficult to win points against good players. I wouldn't say that there's anything better with the platform than the pinpoint is really a personal taste. It depends really on your technique and, and what you're doing. <clears throat> We're gonna try to do a serve series with Tennis Owner Academy and then you can see and uh, make your own mind up whether what serve stance is the best for you uh, and if there's any tweaks you need to do in your serve that will help your game. One question from my good friend Henrik here. Um, what is the most effective racket you have ever used? The frame that created most chaos? Well, a uh, very difficult question. Some rackets, they just feel like rocket launchers. Some days you're on your game, it's just you're painting the court with winners, left, right. And some days you're just off and then the ball is flying and you're spraying balls everywhere. One racket that I really felt that like I could hit winners with, that I felt like wow, uh, was the head, the head Graphene 360 Extreme Pro. It might be a bit of a recency bias, but that's the one I really felt like wow, if I just man managed to contact the ball properly with enough spin. The racket deals with the rest, amazing power, hitting corners. I was seeing a lot of forehand winners from weird positions on the court. Uh, and with my forehand that I've been struggling, I felt that racket really helped me the most to get more power and spin. So uh, the head, the Graphene 360 Extreme Pro, it's a good racket, it's a tough racket to control, but when you get the right amount of spin on it, that racket can really uh, explode the ball. And um, it's a racket I really like to play with. How do you deal with tennis elbow? Well, you need to rest, you need to try to figure out where the elbow injury came from. Is it something in your technique? Uh, a lot of players that use more of a Western uh, grip uh, and they more get this movement to get the windshield wiper spin and the wrist, they tend to get more elbow issues uh, than instead of you playing quarter more of a flatter game. So uh, maybe it's from your technique, that's something you need to change. Maybe you have a really high string tension on your stiff poly string. Maybe you're using a really stiff racket so you have to really figure out, but then rest and uh, you know, obviously maybe there's some exercises you can do, I'm not a doctor in any way, but take these things seriously because if you can't play tennis it's a really sad thing, at least for me. Uh, I've had wrist issues, uh, I have some kind of wrist bruising inside the wrist right now that uh, is bothering me from time to time and uh, it's really a pain because I want to play tennis every other day at least and uh, if it's hampering me from doing what I love it's a big problem. So uh, take your injuries, injuries seriously, go to the physio, figure out what it is, don't overplay, use the right equipment and make sure you can play tennis as long as you can in your life. I think that's important. In, here's from Giovanni Manfrini, which position of the racket do I put lead tape to increase stability and power? Well, um, there are different positions, like if you make the racket heavier, you will increase stability somewhat, but then if you want to improve stability, particularly when you hit the ball, maybe increase the twist weight, I would put lead tape at 3 and 9. So I would put lead tape at 3 and 9. In that case, here and here, maybe you start with 2 grams on each side, and um, that will increase stability, you will get a bit more power. However, the racket will be tougher to swing, so you might counterbalance by removing the grip and adding some lead tape here uh, on the pallet and then putting the grip back on. Uh, depends on how headlight you want it, but it does change the characteristic of the frame a bit when you add lead tape. But 3 and 9 are kind of my favorite positions. I grew up playing uh, Wilson Encode 6195 and it has quite a lot of weight on the sides and that's probably why I like that. So if you really want to increase swing weight, and that this also increases stability and power more than the 3 and 9, 
um, doesn't increase stability more but the power level of the rack goes up you add some lead tape here around 12 o'clock you can also go to the 10 and the 2 positions weight at 12 will polarize the frame so there will be more weight here and here uh, which will be better for spin that's kind of the weight setup that Federer uses uh, and Nadal, for example, so more weight here and here, the weight in the polar ends of the racket, that's going to help your spin. This one is better for stability at 3 and 9, and the plow through, because the racket is less prone to twisting on contact because of the weight. Uh, so it's really up to you, you have to experiment a bit. Start with 3 and 9 and you can see how it goes. Now I got a question here from Atish Tripathi, excuse my pronunciation, um, partly I might have some Swinglish going on because I'm Swedish, I'm living in Malta, um, I did my some university years in the US, but I'm still uh, a Swede. What's the cost of living in Malta? Uh, the cost of living here have gone up uh, recent years because of like economic progress. Some international companies in online industries are coming here, more people are moving here. I would say there's almost too many people living here now because it's a bit more congested than when I came, so there's been a big change in 10, 12 years. So the cost has gone up. There's a lot more restaurants to choose from and uh, more shopping to be done and, but the apartment prices have gone up significantly so it's definitely pretty high cost of living uh, if you're working in online industries such as online gaming etc you get a better salary but if you're working in a cafe or a restaurant and stuff it's definitely lower salaries than in sweden for example and the rents are still quite high so it's not that easy here, uh, a lot of people have like two jobs, one part-time uh, and one full-time just to make ends meet. So I wouldn't say the cost of living is that low. Sadly I cannot recommend that Malta is a great pay place to move to uh, based on that. I like it and it's my home but um, it might not be for everyone, it's become quite congested. There's a lot of issues with traffic and noise and um, there's a lot of beauty to this island but uh, we need to um, find a way through this situation that's right now going on. So that would be my personal take on it. I've been here 12 years now and it's been quite a drastic change. From Air Colli, I have been with Dunlop all my life and I'm planning to switch to Bubble Out. Um, do you think it's a good move to go to the pure drives from previously playing with the Dunlop M30? Well, I mean it's it's a hard thing to say without having seen your uh, game or technique. Uh, everybody needs to know that the Pure Drive, or most people know probably already, that the Pure Drive is packed full of power. It's quite a stiff racket, so if you have arm problems, it's not the recommendation I would give you. It's a fun racket to use because the free power is immense. You get a lot of spin, especially with the most recent edition of the Pure Drive. But if you play with a lot of spin and you're able to handle the power, Yes, go ahead, try it. Uh, I think you, you'll, you'll really like it if, if that's what you want. But if you need more control, maybe a bit more feel, I think there's a lot of better options than the Pure Drive out there. But for flatter players, it's gonna sail a lot, you know. Uh, in, in the end, it's gonna be tough to use it effectively. And you might have to string higher to get any kind of control, and then you have risk of arm issues, because the higher the string, uh, a poly string in a powerful racket, the more problems you might have with your tendons in the arm, etc. Because you get more vibrations traveling down to the elbow or the wrist. If you could only use three rackets for the rest of your life, which would you choose from Bao Gutang? Wow, that's a difficult question. Uh, three island rackets. Well, I might have to go with the Head Pro Tour 630, the so-called PT57A as one of them, because it's such a legendary feel, a great racket, uh, nice on uh, touch shots, etc. It's difficult to use, I can't really use it effectively anymore to be honest but that could be one of them bubble up soft drive is one that has a really soft spot in my heart so that would have to come as well i would like to say a 6195 because that's what i started playing with uh, or i would go with the my head liquid metal radical tour which has been really close to my heart for the last couple of years uh, but the head pro tour the head liquid metal radical tour and the bubble up soft drive would probably be my three choices, although the two head rackets are quite close, so it's not the most clever choice, maybe. Um, which racket should I switch to if I like the spin of pure aero, but want more control and less power? Wow, that's a difficult question. Um, most rackets have more control and less power than the pure aero, so that's one choice. But if you want similar characteristics, perhaps, you should check out the um, V-Core 98 from Yonex, that's quite a 
powerful racket with good spin, but it's a bit less power. Depends on how much you want to, you know, increase your level of control. Uh, the Pure Drive VS didn't get like a fantastic glowing review, but it's it's uh, definitely a bit more controlled choice than the Pure Arrow. So you could try that if you like bobble up sticks. Maybe a Pure Strike. They're releasing the new Pure Strike very soon, so uh, I think the 98 could be interesting. The Pure Strike. Interesting question from Joey Ob2000. Are modern frames worth $200 for the so-called technology? He writes such as countervail graphene 360 or is it better to go with the classic frames that most pros play with such as head liquid radicals older model wilsons which are already heavily used and heavily reviewed and quite cheaper traditional player frames are great uh, and you can play really nice tennis with them but they are tougher to use especially in the modern game when you have to have faster swing speeds and more spin so in that case i maybe recommend that you actually try newer technology um, however you can Take, let's say, a first edition Pure uh, Aero or a Aero Pro Drive, as they called it before. And this one plays spin friendly, gives you quite good power, and you probably can find one cheap uh, used somewhere. So that's one option. You don't have to go back so many years uh, to find like a, a used cheaper frame that you can take out into tournaments. I would definitely re recommend a lot of players to actually test bigger head sizes if they're stuck in the 93-95. I'm trying to move from 95 square inch rackets to 98 to 100 to get more spin, a bit free power, a bit easier to use. Uh, I think that's kind of the way tennis is going and the way to go uh, if you want to um, get the max out of your tennis. You could definitely find used frames quite on the cheap. Uh, you don't have to go for a traditional player frame, but you can go for a 98, like a K-Factor blade or any blade 98 really will give you a decent modern frame, for example. The new technologies, they work in some cases, but might not be your cup of tea. Uh, they're trying to push the envelope a little bit, but still, if you take a racket from 2007, you will still get good performance and will be enough for most players. So it's not like a huge evolution in tennis. Uh, that's happening in the last two three years. No, you, you can actually use a racket from 10 years back and be 100% happy with that. One question here from uh, user Skyguide is Big Banger technology a marketing term or is it legitimately something that separates Luxalum from the rest? I wouldn't say, I mean, when the Luxalum Big Banger was released more than 20 years ago, it was something that separated um, Luxalum from the rest because there were no poly strings, popular poly strings out on the market, so it kind of you know, revolutionize the way players uh, play today. Uh, Guga Querton, uh, Gustavo Querton was the guy who made it popular um, and then people kind of moved on to the bandwagon of poly strings uh, which give you more spin and control. But today, in to compare a Luxon Nolo Power or a Big Banger to another string from a modern company, another poly string, it's just different you know there's no revolutionary materials in Luxalon. I mean Luxalon make really nice strings they're a bit more costly than most other brands but they're not necessarily much better it's just a matter of taste I would say. Big Banger is just a name and there's nothing new in technology wise it was when it came and it's a kind of a legend in the string market for that reason but there's many 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 poly strings for lower prices out there that can compete today so um, you definitely don't need to break the bank to play with a good poly. One question from Mark Seabrook. One, is this your only job? No, it's not. I've been working as a marketing consultant for about a few years now. I've been working in various roles in marketing uh, for 15 years, CMO level, and uh, for the last couple of years, finance, online gaming, um, and other industries. One question from Giancarlo King. How would you describe The Clash a fad or something worthwhile? There's been a lot of hype around The Clash. As you know, uh, I did a review of The Clash Tour and The Clash Prototype and I really like them. They're really interesting new rackets. I don't think it's a fad. Uh, one of the concerns I've had with that racket is the string movement of The Clash 100 because I think uh, it seems to uh, lose tension and break strings quite quickly. That's the only concern I have, otherwise I'm really happy with that racket. I don't think it's a fad. As a good example of a fad would be the spin effect patterns that Wilson released uh, a few years ago. I didn't think they, they went down that well. Uh, but this one I think has some potential when it comes to the free flex and stable smart technologies. I think they need to do an update to get it a bit better uh, with the string breakage and the string movement, but 
Otherwise, I'm really happy about the Clash and it's something I could definitely see myself using in tournament play and I have used it. Uh, I'm not 100% comfortable when, when playing match play uh, because I feel like uh, it's not doesn't suit my game style but for a lot of players it, it's a great racket and something you should test at least. Have you hit with the Vocal C10 Pro? Uh, I have hit with the Vocal C10 Pro and it's a great racket, it's flexible, it's quite heavy so I'm trying to move away from 350 gram plus strong rackets uh, and, and become a bit faster with my swing speed and, and try to get more spin into my game more naturally. So I don't think the Vocal C10 Pro would work for my game uh, these days, but it's a great racket, it's a classic. You should definitely test one if you haven't done so before, but it's quite heavy, uh, so keep that in mind. But beautiful frame. Strings Tension is a question from M. Strings and Tension, well, I'm a polyester guy, uh, I'm not made out of polyester, but uh, I like poly strings, and I do like a bit firmer poly string. The Yonex Polytor Strike, I really love that. I tested it a little while ago. Uh, Hyper G, Solinko Hyper G is one of my favorite strings. I do like Luxon Auto Power. So I do like a bit of a firmer response in my string. If they get too spongy, I, uh, I don't like that so much. Uh, I do also enjoy the Headhawk Touch. It's a bit softer, but you have a really nice snapback when the strings move and snap back into place for more spin. When I string a poly, I usually go around 23 to 22 kilos, which is around 51 pounds. And uh, that's just like my reference tension. And then depending on how powerful the racket is, I might go up to 25, like I did with the Clash. Or if it's more controlled, I might go down to 21, 20, 21 kilos. Uh, there are players that use really low tensions, but it really depends on what you like or not. You know, uh, there are also guys that use really high tensions, like Vavrinka, for example, is a guy who really blasts the ball and he uses RPM blast at a quite high tension, like 27 kilos or something like that. And then you have uh, a guy like Manarino who uses, I don't even know exactly which string he uses, it's a poly and he strings it around 14, 15 kilos, ridiculously low. And uh, somehow through his snap of his wrist or whatever he does, he doesn't really have a big swing. He just hits a lot with the wristy technique. He seems to play really, really nice tennis with it. So uh, it's really up to you. You have to experiment, try an ultra low tension, try a high tension, find somewhere in between maybe. Depends on your playing style. But I'm definitely around 23 kilos, stiffer polyester, and then I'm usually quite happy. Is MGR slash I important to you? A question from Mr. Veikolainen. It is not that important uh, and it's a topic I will dig deeper into in another video. Uh, there are guys who talk a lot about this kind of measurement. It's interesting, it's something as a nerd we should dive into a bit more, so I, I would leave that for another video, but it's not something I try to look into too much myself. Another thing I want to talk about, um, I've been testing these shoes, they're uh, Head Super Fabric, Head Sprint SF, um, really nice shoes actually, I haven't used Head shoes before, uh, I have to be honest, uh, so this is kind of a new experiment, I'm testing two pairs of shoes, the other one is yet to be released, but this one should be released very soon. Uh, they come with different laces, uh, so they kind of suit the gravity rackets, which I think is really cool. So I will try to show you this in the camera. They're a bit dirty because I've been playing with them a lot. Durability, thanks to the super fabric material, is, is really good, it seems like. I break shoes uh, quite quickly because I uh, play on really kind of sandpaper-like cement courts. So, but these ones seem to last really well and uh, they look cool with their kind of two-tone and, and black. What Head did well I think this time was that they really stayed with their graphic, graphic design and elements and they kept the color palette of the shoes and the bag and everything. So uh, these are really nice shoes. You can see the two-tone of the gravity uh, and you flip them around like this. That's it for this week's Q&A and Tennis Nerd vlog. If you have any questions for next week's edition of me talking into a camera and boring you to death, please write them in the comments below. Uh, I'll be more than happy to try to deal with as many of them as time allows. Um, if you like this format, click like. Please subscribe to Tennis Nerd and tell all your friends about the channel. I really appreciate all the help I can get to get this to grow and become something bigger in the future. Thanks a lot and I hope you get to play some tennis.